thanks for coming out on this last morning of the festival and surviving all of the security hurdles. Um, it's good to see everybody. Um, I'm David Leonhardt of the New York Times, and I'm here with Ron Daniels, whom I'm sure you all know is the president of Johns Hopkins University. Ron is also an immigrant to this country, a native of Toronto. He was the dean of the law school at the University of Toronto. He was the, the provost at the University of Pennsylvania um, before becoming president at Johns Hopkins. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Toronto and of Yale. And we are going to talk about both um, uh, private universities and mostly public universities today. Um, and we're going to start off by having a conversation, and then we're going to open up the conversation to all of you and, and rope you in. Um, and I guess I want to I want to start by just talking about what incredibly important institutions our public universities are. Right, um, the University of California is the signature one, but they have led to all these incredible scientific discoveries. They've been economic engines. Uh, they have been really important um, ladders of you know, mobility. Why are you so worried about our public universities? What's the problem, in essence? So it's as you say, David, uh, public universities are absolutely critical to the strength of the country, and they've played a vaunted role in American history. Um, but uh, as uh, has been covered extensively over the last decade in particular, uh, public universities have first and foremost confronted very significant financial hardship. What was at one time an, um, uh, a situation where there is very strong state investment in public universities, particularly since the Great Recession, but trends were even underway beforehand. There has been a significant reduction in the level of state support for public universities. Um, and that, of course, has precipitated significant increases in tuition for public universities. The level of tuition increases of public universities, in fact, over the last eight years or so, have far outstripped what we've seen um, in comparable peer private institutions. So all of that um, is rocking the foundations of public universities. But more than that, public universities are subject to a whole host of different constraints that really limit their capacity to be competitive with private peers, with their capacity to discharge a lot of the goals that they were originally created to serve, whether you're talking about um, massive social mobility, whether it's industrial policy objectives for the lo local economy. Um, in a number of different ways, uh, regulation is really hobbling their ability to function effectively. And I think compounding that, and something that has, again, attracted a lot of attention over the last several years, has been the massive politicization of public universities. I mean, these have been sites of extreme controversy, where you see boards of trustees, regents, governors really weighing in with distinct visions of the university that often are not greeted with enthusiasm. And then you find you're engulfed in a crisis that you know, very often results in the departure of presidents of public universities. What's really significant, and for me very jarring, as um, a president of a not-for-profit private, but the leading umbrella organization for American research universities is the American Association of Universities. There's about 60 universities that are members of that organization, half publics, half privates. And these are the pinnacle research universities in the country. What you see is that the rate of turnover for presidents of public universities is twice the level of private universities. And again, just underscores the kind of convulsive environment in which public universities are operating right now. So I want to ask about precisely that, but I just want to pause for one second on what you said about tuition, because I think it's really important, and I think it's lost on a lot of people, right? People see the sticker prices of places like Harvard and Stanford and Colorado College going up, up, up. But actually, a lot of the elite publics have essentially a lot of the elite privates have essentially matched those with increases in financial aid. So the real cost of going to these private schools has not gone up. But the real cost of going to the publics has soared, right? Absolutely. So you know, on a number of different dimensions, if you look at uh, what has happened, again, since the Great Recession, the net tuition levels, net tuition is a concept which essentially is, what is the cost of tuition? minus the amount of average financial aid that is meted out to students in the institution. Um, if you look at what's happened in net tuition at public universities, it's increased by 136% uh, since the Great Recession. At private universities, private nonprofits, 
Um, and so what you're finding is you're now in a world where in a lot of ways, um, private nonprofits are in fact more accessible than a lot of elite public universities. And that's reflected in the fact that, again, over the last several years, you've actually seen a trend where more students are graduating without debt from not-for-profit privates than they are from public universities. So let's come back to the turnover thing. What is driving that turnover? Is it something has changed within the universities? Is it, is it that something has changed within, within the state governments, where the state governments are becoming much more interested in getting involved? Why are public university presidents not lasting very long? So I think it's a number of different things. I think at one level, it is um, a political environment, which we know across the country, that has just become meaner and more polarized. And you'll see that one of the sites for controversy is often the university. And again, because universities raise these questions about access, who gets into university, the privilege associated with having received a, um, a university education, the role that universities play in local industrial policy goals, uh, all of these issues, the importance of universities, make these important sites. And again, I think as politics have become uglier, a lot of these controversies have played out within uh, universities. At another level, um, I think uh, what you're seeing is that increasingly with the loss of financial support from the states, and again, when you see how significant the reduction in state support is for state-sponsored public institutions, you find that a lot of things have been unleashed that universities have to do to stay competitive. So, as states have reduced um, their uh, support for public education, and again, quite dramatically, by about 25% over the last, uh, last uh, seven, eight years, public universities have forced to, as I said a moment ago, raise uh, private tuition levels. And again, that are, uh, raise their tuition levels. And that has, again, created controversy within these institutions. And again, has raised issues about whether the universities are remaining accessible, whether they're um, uh, supporting enough um, students within state as opposed to out of state students and so forth. But again, the financial shock has created a lot of conflict, which has exacerbated trends that I think were underway beforehand. So before, you have a really intriguing idea of how to address some of this. Before I get to that, I want to ask you a personal question, which is, why do you care about this? You're the president of a private university, right, to do your job well. To some extent, you could ignore all this. You could even benefit from it by recruiting away faculty from the University of Maryland and Penn State and, and UCSD. Right. Why have you decided you want to take this on? So I guess it's several reasons. One is that I'm a product of a public university. The University of Toronto is a pinnacle public university in Canada. And so um, as, a, as someone who has grown up both as a student and as a faculty member in a public university, I respect the role of public universities and I've benefited very personally from that education. At another level, you just have to recognize that as important as not-for-profit privates are, public universities still continue to play a very important and distinctive role in the United States that, um, that I think uh, privates don't do to the same degree. Um, there are four times as many students in public universities as in private. So for me, it is watching my leadership, peer leadership at the AAU and seeing how much time they are spending in defensive actions uh, fending off uh, intervention by uh, governors and regents who have political agendas, and seeing how that detracts from their mission, seeing the extent to which just a whole host of issues that we don't give a moment's thought to, public university presidents, whether it's dealing with um, how they uh, do procurement, to how they deal with unionized employees, to how they set tuition levels, um, to even how they actually exploit intellectual property created within those institutions, they are just subject to a much heavier overlay of regulation, which I think impairs their function. So I think for me, what it's really about is a sense that these are really important institutions. The country as a whole benefits from the heterogeneity of higher education in this country where you have publics and privates that have distinctive and sometimes overlapping uh, and competitive, are highly competitive with one another, but it's com 
created a system that um, is tremendously vibrant, and yet you now see that um, their ways are really parting, and there is a distinct advantage to us as not-for-profit privates, which is not available to the publics. You know, it's funny. One thing that that makes me think about is the fact that even though the elite privates are often more affordable, that's not something that many lower-income students are even able to grasp. And as a result, the publics have this role in terms of economic right. mobility that is unmatched, which is a, a one of the reasons why they're so important. That's right. So, What's the solution? How can we start to get these incredibly important institutions in our society, scientifically, economically, these, just, these deeply important institutions, how can we get them functioning better? So at one level, um, I think you can take some, um, some heart from what has been happening with the elite not-for-profit privates in the country and seeing how, although there was a time when public universities had a very distinct role that focused on accessibility, that's uh, focused on social development within their regions, on economic development. We've seen a world in which not-for-profit privates, like the one I lead, are moving into more of those issues. And again, the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, that you've seen over the last several years, a lot of effort by not-for-profit privates to try and reduce their uh, tuition levels to the most disadvantaged students and to be more creative and outreach to those students reflects there's some kind of convergence going uh, on in that domain as well in other domains. And I say all of that because we're doing that with a governance structure that is by and large based on um, boards of trustees that are self-perpetuating, that don't have, typically don't have state representatives on it. Um, they're multi-stakeholder, typically dominated by alumni, but turn out to be enormously responsive to the public interest. And I think a lot of the decisions we've made over the last several years shows the capacity of this kind of model to be uh, very attentive to public goals, but with a traditional not-for-profit private form of organization. So I think at one level, I'm uh, arguing for depoliticizing boards of trustees, taking the role of governors and state legislatures out of the business of appointing members of, the, of uh, boards of public universities. And I think also creating greater clarity around the mandates of these uh, boards and the universities so that uh, the state government is less obtrusive in the day-to-day -day affairs of the, uh, of the uh, institutions. And I think the final thing that um, I think is necessary is just some agreement on the core compact that governs uh, public higher education in the states. By that I mean if there's clarity about what the state universities are supposed to be doing and how they discharge their role, then I think um, you can imagine a situation where state governments say, here's the funding formula. You know, we're gonna give you this over the next five to 10 years, go out and discharge your mission, understand what the public investment will be, but we're gonna get out of a lot of the micromanagement of these institutions, and quite frankly, um, uh, creating situations where there's a lot of rent-seeking behavior going on that is subverting academic mission. And so what would this look like? Let's, let's let's imagine a state that actually did this. Would it apply to all of the publics? Would it apply to just all the four years? Would it apply just to the, the, the jewel in the crown? Um, uh, and, and how would it work? So my instinct is to start off, and I'm um, a bit Burkean here in the way I'm thinking about this, but I think you want to be incrementalist here. And what I would do is to start off and to say that I think uh, the place to uh, try some of these experiments, and some of these to varying degrees are underway now in the United States, but I would do it with the AAU institution. So these are the 30 top public universities in the country. This is University of Texas, Austin, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, Berkeley, um, Michigan, Virginia. You know, these are the institutions talk about to give them this kind of flexibility and to see what happens, um, and to start there, and to see what lessons we can learn from that. And so the state government would essentially, would they absent themselves entirely? Would they still appoint the head of the board of trustees? What might a model look think, like? I think, again, you, know, you can see different variants uh, here. You could imagine a situation that the state, um, first of all, has an output-based agreement about what the university should be doing. So saying, look, we want you to educate uh, this percentage of in-state students, 
Um, we want to see these kinds of completion rates for students within six years, um, things of that character. We want to see this percentage of class um, being Pell recipients. You can do that, set broad goals, and then I think you can imagine standing back and letting these boards of trustees understand what they, what they do as against those goals. And I think, I think you could imagine um, having one or two representatives uh, appointed by the state on the boards but I would not, um, I would not um, create a situation where that's half uh, publicly appointed, um, meaning state appointed, and then half through some self-perpetuating mechanism. Again, you see you know, what's gone on in the University of California system where the regents are you know, literally um, undergo, un, uh, waging campaigns to secure appointment by the governor of these boards and the political favors that are being traded back and forth, again, subverts, I think, the integrity of these institutions. It's interesting. It reminds me a bit of the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve isn't perfect. I've criticized certain things they've done over the last five years. But, um, but as a model, the idea right. that we have a, a, a body in which the leader of it is appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Congress, but, but you don't have the President and the Congress there every month making decisions on interest rates seems to have worked quite well. I think that's right, David. You can see it across you know, a number of different institutions where you have this independence, but nevertheless, there is accountability that is forced on you, first of all, through market competition, through you can have transparency of performance evaluation. And again, that's another way of forcing um, accountability. And then again, you can imagine some representation on the boards to uh, again reinforce this sense of the state's interest in this. But you know, just again, another way of underscoring the perversity of the world that we're in now for a lot of public institutions in this country is um, seeing the extent to which, as a percentage of the total operating budget that the state is providing. Um, whereas there was a time when state universities were receiving as much as 75% of their operating budget from state governments. We're now in a world where, on average, that's around 20, 25%. There are, there are several universities in this country, public universities, where the state is providing no more than 10% of the operating budget, and yet still controlling boards of trustees, having an extensive overlay of regulation um, that is distinctive and different in kind from what we see in the not-for-profit privates. So again, it's this gross disequilibrium between the, even the financial investment and the kind of governance and regulatory instruments that are being used to protect that investment. So the states have essentially abdicated their responsibilities but kept their rights, right? It's like what England wants with Europe. Exactly. Um, so I'm, imagine I'm an aide to, the, to a governor or a legislature and you're making this case to me. My response is, hey, my governor campaigned really hard and, and, and won this hard fought election and now has all this power and you're asking her or him to give it up. Why should we do that? What's the answer? Well, so I think I think you know this bumps up against a conversation that you have throughout uh, throughout the Aspen uh, Institute uh, Festival, and that is, you know, do good ideas ultimately prevail uh, over craven political interests? Um, and you know, here I think that at one level, this is a good and commanding idea that we can still get very responsive institutions that will bring distinction. Uh, to the states and play a critical role in all of the areas that we talked about earlier from educating students for the workforce that is required in the state to industrial policy objectives to social objectives and so on. So you can get all of that um, and um, with this model and I think ultimately that's really important for the state's uh, uh, interest. So it's, it's in some sense an appeal to a higher idea of the public good but also I think it recognizes that Although at one level, the demand for places in these institutions by students is still significant, that uh, these institutions on one level look like they're robust, but the reality is that they're losing um, competitive capacity, that they're losing faculty, uh, they're often losing students in head-to-head -head competitions with uh, not-for-profit privates. Um, and so on a number of different dimensions, if you care about the long-term strength of the state, you've got to worry about these core institutions. And so I think this is, this is a, um, yeah, a, an appeal to the better angels of political leadership to say, 
this is something that we want to bequeath to the state. And in some sense, we want to depoliticize an institution that is so core to the fabric of, uh, of the society uh, in uh, which uh, we're operating today. If we're in a human capital world, then these institutions, given the role in research and discovery and job creation, are the vital engines that have to be nurtured appropriately. So it's, it's, it's an appeal to long-term um, interests of the state. Yeah. And, and while I, I tend to think elite universities will be, are not under great short-term or even medium-term threat, I assume you could also make the case, look, given the rise of technology, higher education should not be acting fat and happy, right? And they should, you should free them up to be more nimble to deal with the changes in technology that could have big effects for education. Well. Which, which I think is, um, again, is really important when you think about just the amount of time that public university presidents are spending currying favor with the legislature, managing very nasty politics, you yeah. know, particularly just seeing even the vicissitudes in states which are going back and forth between different political parties, and again, how that disrupts mission, freeing the campus up from having to worry about those issues to focus on the core social role of the institution, I think is a very significant dividend for these institutions and for the states of which they're part. You mentioned a few minutes ago that there are already some uh, early examples, not of this quite happening, but there are early, some small ways in which aspects of it are happening. Where can, where, what do you see that you can say, look, that's not what I'm talking about, but it's starting to go down that path? So Michigan, University of Michigan, uh, fabulous public institution, um, has a pretty significant constitutional autonomy, has clear understanding with the state as to the nature of the relationship with the state, what it has to do for financial support. Um, it, um, it also has a board that is not directly appointed by the governor, but is publicly elected. And I think, and, 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 uh, and I think that creates its own problems. So you see the starts, uh, you see at least the foundation of having constitutional autonomy, which is helpful. Um, you know, there was a really interesting experiment that um, was proposed in Oregon uh, a few years ago, which unfortunately uh, failed. But in that case, the University of Oregon uh, went to the governor and said, look, here's the deal. Um, you are not investing in public universities any longer. The level of, of investment has diminished steadily over time. For a variety of reasons, you're moving funds from education to healthcare and particularly to Medicare. Um, that's your decision. But um, if that's the case, we've got to put the university on a stronger foundation. And the proposal was essentially that the state um, create a bond issue of about $800 million that it would support and be used as matching funds for the university to create an endowment that at the end of a fixed period of time would give, this, give the institution uh, financial uh, autonomy. And so again, I think experiments like that are, that's quite extreme, but I sure would love to see in, um, in this country the possibility for that kind of experimentation, again, in a bid to preserve the excellence of these institutions. In a way, it's, it is, if, if you wanna see this idea happen, I think it's good news that it's been floated and then shot down. Right, because that I feel like that's often the way public policy just soften work. you soften up yeah. uh, the policy process or political process for this change. I mean, in a very different way, Philadelphia just passed a soda tax. In a weird way, it is related though, because as you just noted, the biggest competition for education dollars is healthcare dollars. Right. Philadelphia just passed a soda tax after soda tax is failing seven times in, in different places. Right. So, uh, so when we get to questions, I invite anyone to ask about this subject, but I wanna, since we have you, I wanna go through a couple of other sure. big topics. You co-authored a, a fascinating and honestly disturbing op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about how much of our 
uh, research dollars are moving away from young researchers. I'm going to get the decimal places wrong, but a generation ago, 5.6% of federal funding went to scientists under the age of 35, and it's now below 2%. It's like 1.6%, 1.5%. I mean, that's remarkable, right? right. It's a dropping of, of, of a third. You know, by two-thirds, we've dropped the amount we're giving to young researchers. Um, uh, I find that very disturbing for what it means for the long-term future of, of scientists' careers. Um, why is that happening, and what can we do about it? So, uh, David, as you mentioned, this is, a, this is an issue that has been on the public policy agenda for about 15 years. And um, it, it, there's, it's been subject to a number of high-level task force who have decried the fact that particularly the National Institute of Health, which spends about $30 billion a year on health-based research, and it is a great engine for research across uh, American universities. Um, it, it, was, it was noted about 15 years ago that increasingly young investigators were losing grant support in comparison to older investigators. And there was lots of hand wringing and, and lots of recommendations made uh, to uh, change that trend. But in fact, as you indicate, uh, the trend has actually gotten worse rather than better, even from 15 years ago when people were already quite disturbed about this. So you know, for us in universities right now, for the NIH, the um, gold standard for uh, investigators is getting a so-called R01 grant. It's a grant given to people who are able to perform independent research. Um, and it is, it is the source of the critical support that allows uh, health uh, research and innovation in health research. And it's now gone uh, from a world in uh, which, again, um, the uh, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, the average age of receiving an R01 grant was 38. That's already pretty late for someone to get their first independent grant. Um, it's now 45. So it's, it's a really serious issue, and serious because if you look back at the great scientific breakthroughs that are made, they are typically made by young people. Look at Newton, Einstein, Watson, and Crick. Um, you, know, you just go through and multiply the examples that it's typically people in their 20s and early 30s who aren't burdened by convention, who can think about a field anew and can really make transformative change. And those are the people who are falling out of the system. It is happening, I believe, for a variety of different reasons. Um, I think there's probably some distortions in the way in which funding is allocated in the NIH. I think there's some uh, complications uh, by the way in which peer review is done, and I think there's clearly advantages to incumbents. But uh, essentially, it is a, it's a really serious issue that I think jeopardizes the future quality of, um, of uh, research in the United States, and again, something that has been so important for industrial competitiveness in this country. How much of it is a reflection of the fact that faculties have gotten older, right? That, that is, as human lifespan, particularly for more educated people, has increased, and there is no mandatory retirement age, how much it is, is a reflection simply of the fact that there are more 70, 50, 60, 70, 80, even 80-year-old 80 faculty members out so, there? So that's there. So it's clearly the case that there are, you know, that we're seeing with the end of mandatory retirement and increased longevity. Um, you're, seeing, you're seeing more people within the workforce who are above 65. But having said that, you wouldn't have expected to see uh, such a precipitous drop in the level of funding for young investigators if you assume that it was a completely neutral level playing field where young investigators should still be able to maintain or not suffer the kind of diminution, at least, in the level of overall share of funding that they receive from the NIH. It's really instructive right now. There are uh, twice as many people over 65 receiving R01 grants from the NIH as there are under 35. So again, we're seeing... Twice know, as many over 65 as under 35. As under 35. And again, you know, it may not be... It's, I don't think this is malign or deliberate, but the net effect is whatever institutional patterns we've seen to emerge are systematically disadvantaging uh, the, younger, um, the younger faculty. And again... I think jeopardizing the quality of the scientific enterprise. And just one more point to, uh, 
to, uh, to uh, reinforce the point. But it's not just that you're losing um, the kind of breakthrough science when, again, can you imagine how many other fields do you say to someone, we're going to keep you in a state of protracted tutelage until you're in your mid-40s, and then we'll let just, you know, play around and do something interesting. There's not many fields that do that, so that, that has a pernicious effect. But it also means that, that you are um, impairing your ability to recruit a more diverse, more women, more minorities into the scientific workforce because people are not coming with funding, and that in turn deters your capacity to recruit them into universities. I realize you can't do this as a single uh, university president, even one of a place like Johns Hopkins, but would the world be better off if we had some collusion and 30 of the top university presidents got together and announced that tenure was going to still exist, but it wouldn't be lifelong, it would just be for 40 years or 30 years? Uh, so you're asking me about the value of collusion or the value <laughs> of <laughs> The value tenure. of mandatory retirement, basically. That if we said, right, if we basically said, look, t we are not, when we grant you tenure, we're not saying that you get to stay forever. We're saying you have academic freedom. You can stay either till age 70 or 430 or 35 years. It seems to me that would address some of these problems. Maybe. You know, I guess, you know, I take a, uh, you know, a slightly different view. That is, it's not that there is not good scientific contribution being made by people over 65. Um, and so, again, I think you know, what we've got to do with, in a world with or without tenure is you've got to make sure you've got good performance review and you're managing people to the right place. So, you, know, you have, I have seen in my, in my 20 plus years of academic leadership, there are people at 35 that have kind of burnt out and should not be at universities, whereas there's people who are 70 and are firing all cylinders and bringing lots of dynamism and fresh ideas to the professoriate. I think our challenge is to find ways to make sure that we can manage those issues on all ends and be consistent in ensuring that, uh, that uh, you get uh, strong performance, whatever the age of the faculty member. But for me, I think, if you're asking, is there a need for some kind of coordinated response by the AAU and other institutions who are worried about these issues? I think the answer is yes. I'm not sure it's changing tenure rules, but it is finding ways, and we're doing this as, as a number of universities are, we're trying to use our own funds to push it down to the younger faculty so that we can get them grant ready and hopefully accelerate the path to receiving these independent uh, funds from the NIH. But Again, um, our resources are limited against the incredible bounty that is the NIH. So ultimately, we have to work hand in hand with the NIH to reform these issues and ultimately with Congress. And the last year or so, the issue is gaining some traction within Congress and there's uh, several members of Congress who are starting to worry about this issue as well. Last thing before we open it up, Baltimore, your home city. Uh, it's obviously been in the news a lot, the Freddie Gray case, um, as a place that has, has become both a, a symbol and a, a manifestation of a lot of the urban problems we continue to have, even as American cities have enjoyed something of a renaissance over the last 20 years. I know you've gotten more involved in Baltimore. Um, how do you think about what's happening and what has happened in Baltimore and what the future of a city like Baltimore looks like? So, um, you know, it's a, it's a topic for a, a, another obviously uh, very long conversation, but um, Hopkins is the largest uh, private employer in uh, the state of Maryland and in Baltimore. And as I've said all through my presidency, uh, Hopkins isn't just uh, at or in, but very much of the city of Baltimore. So goes Baltimore, so goes Hopkins. So we're intensely interested in what's uh, happened um, and is happening, and not just uh, since Freddie Gray, but well before. Um, and I think that's just the simplest thing I can say is that, um, you know, what was so striking, and I know there's some Baltimoreans in the room, what was so striking for those of us who uh, live in Baltimore is that um, problems that we were in some sense, we knew were there, were hidden in plain sight. I think the nature of what happened with Freddie Green, in particular following Ferguson and Staten Island, where uh, for a lot, of, a lot of these other cases, which attracted significant media attention, the story was, if only we had an African-American mayor, if only we had an African-American police chief, if only we had an African-American city council, we would get different results. Well, you know, but by the time it came to Baltimore, 
we had all of those things, and yet we still had the same problems. And I think what was so striking, and I think very important, was because you didn't have an easy answer that it was just a change in the complexion, literally, of leadership that was going to provide the answer, that forced, I think, a recognition of the magnitude of the institutional failings that um, we have in Baltimore. In truth, I think, are characterized a number of, of American cities, but everything from a woefully underperforming uh, K-12 system to lack of green space to high levels of violence and problems in criminal justice. So the agenda that's been, that has been uh, revealed, I think, in some ways, is very daunting. And yet, at another level, What's been really striking about Baltimore is a city of 600,000. It's just small enough that you can make change happen. And change is happening. It's got a great foundation community. And um, what's really been exciting is to see the stakeholders of Baltimore, business, foundations, faith community, really rallying and using this as a moment when hopefully we can tip the city in a different direction. So I actually. Um, I think to live in Baltimore, as to live in a lot of cities in America that, under, that are facing these kinds of issues, requires some level of, of cognitive dissonance. Um, but I actually feel, although by no means um, insensitive to the despair that exists within the city, actually I'm quite uh, positive about the possibilities for reform and just the sense that somehow we've hit a moment where I think there's a, there's a real appreciation that the city must be tipped and the city can be tipped. You mentioned K through 12 education. Is there, is there energy around that? Do you see reasons for optimism in the cities? Um, people, are, people are worried about it uh, and there are lots of different um, uh, ex experiments and collaborations going on. Um, I think we still have to see there's been, uh, there uh, is about to be a change in city leadership and we have a um, city school system that is owned by both the state and by the city. And I think as a consequence, uh, accountability is diffused and ambiguous. And so I think, at least to my mind, uh, this might represent an opportunity for us to tackle the core issue of just the governance of the system, tightening the accountability in the hope that with greater appreciation of who the decision makers are um, and what they're accountable for, that we have a hope at um, getting um, more serious change within the system. But there's a, there's a lot to do. And for me, and I know this conversation's been had uh, over the years here at Aspen, What's most distressing is just to see all, um, how bleak the performance of the system is. And year by year, when you look at the problems of Baltimore, if you can't fix fundamentally the core school system and seeing, you know, even though we talk about, and it's nothing to brag about to my mind, 70% completion rate uh, for high schools, but the fact that 15% only of the kids that come out of that are proficient at grade level in mathematics. How can we feel good about that? And every year we're generating another class that is going to face huge hardship um, in uh, the job market and elsewhere. That actually brings us full circle to the beginning of our conversation. It's a, another example of how muddled governance really makes it difficult for institutions to serve society's interests. Agree. So I want to open it up to all of you. Um, uh, we have a, a, a celebrity guest here in the front, Dan Porterfield from Franklin and Marshall, um, who I, I asked to uh, weigh into the conversation with the first question here in the front. Um, and then we'll open it up uh, uh, all from there. And I should just say something about Dan. Dan has, uh, uh, is head of Franklin and Marshall, but has been playing a vanguard role um, in both public and private universities in thinking about ways of uh, using our collective and, and individual capacity to increase access to uh, students from low socioeconomic uh, status families and doing an amazing job. Well, well thank you. Um, I thought this was inspiring to hear the president and leader of one of the greatest private institutions in the country, one of the, one of the single drivers of extraordinary biomedical research, um, research in other areas, advocating for public higher education. And I, uh, I, like you, am watching leaders of systems in Texas, North Carolina, you know, California, Oregon, just get pummeled 
in a political environment that's toxic, um, craven, as you said. And they, in a sense, they can't advocate for themselves because if they come out and say what's actually happening, that their states are shortchanging their citizens and privatizing education, shifting the cost of public education to low-income families and asking them to pay and borrow more, that, that they can't say that or they'll end up being a, themselves a political football. So somebody else has to speak. Um, and it's fantastic you're doing it. I almost think that in celebrating the convergence of private education and public education towards public goals, you're offering almost an agenda for the country, for, uh, for people running for president. You know, how do we re-engage the country in the need for education to be the, s the single driver, really, of all other forms of great national development? Um, and I just would ask if, you would, if you've thought about that at all, that what you're saying today as part of a possible national agenda for education, public and private, higher ed and K through 12, as we, as we enter one of the most divisive elections we're ever going to experience. So, Dan, you know, look, I, I think that's the moment we're in, and each in our own way are trying to contribute to this debate in a way that can underscore the importance of, uh, of education, you know, starting from you know, Jick, Jim Hempman's work on early childhood education. You know, we can talk a lot about the importance of investing in post-secondary education, but in fact, you know, there's a very strong case that the most powerful investments that a state can make if you really want to change outcomes would be in early childhood education. So it starts with, you know, starts with ECE, it goes to K to 12, and then on from there. But, you know, again, how we take this appropriate um, uh, uh, angst and discontent within the country and find a way to bring it back to the kinds of investments and the activities that we have on tap is, is a real challenge. Um, and, um, and again, you know, these are not new ideas. I mean, if you look at uh, the, you know, the work that, for a lot of us, has been very important by Golden and Katz, which uh, two uh, Harvard uh, professors, who a few years ago wrote this book, which was really jarring in terms of seeing the extent to which, you know, as a country, we have ceased to invest in education as a system, and as a consequence, you know, what we're seeing is virtually sclerotic growth in terms of the participation of, um, of American citizens, increased participation in, um, in uh, four-year colleges and post-secondary education, and that has dire effects on the economy. But you know, I, I think our challenge is, and it goes back to David, what you said earlier, how do we, how do we break through you know, the politics, which are so mean and, and uh, polarized and, in some sense, uh, you know, at odds with understanding the importance of this investment and these institutions in society. And um, I don't have a good answer for, uh, we know there's good ideas out there, but how do we break through um, and just yelling louder doesn't seem to be doing the trick. The Golden Cats book comes up, I feel like, on about half the panels that I do, and I recommend it to everyone. It's called The Race Between Education and Technology. It has chapters full of economic formulas, and you can just skip those chapters. The, the yeah. historical chapters um, are lovely, and they work on themselves, and it's the single best history of education um, that I've ever read. Ma'am. I'm Mary Ann Peoples. Though I went to a, a wonderful private university, I am on the foundation board of UC Davis. And um, when I joined this board about six years ago, they were in a $1 billion campaign because public universities now have to raise money like private universities have done forever with their great databases. And there were seven people on the development team. And the billion dollars was raised and the development department is now bigger. But I think I would say to everyone here in Aspen, I went to a public, I went to a private university, but wherever state you live in, you should financially support your private universities. Because I don't even think that California State Universities get 26% from the state. I think that's great. And again, you know, your point underscores this sense of convergence that 
You know, publics are being forced to do development activities. They're forced to increase their tuition levels and so forth. But I would just add a slight uh, addendum to what you said, which is not just to urge people to, to contribute, but I think the critical move here is regulatory reform. I mean, this is, this is an area where we have got to get these institutions out of the political maelstrom and, again, back into a place where they can focus on their core mission without this kind of obtrusive intervention and politicization. Do you worry at all that your idea could lead to even less state funding of public higher education? That the legislatures and the governors would say, okay, you go off on your own, um, uh, have fun. Look, I think there's, you know, these are, these are difficult trade-offs and I think that's a fair question. Um, but look, um, I think the answer to that is uh, that states have had deep and, um, and persistent levels of control and yet they have massively disinvested in these institutions. So I'm not sure it can get any worse. And at least you, know, you imagine that you're creating the capacity for more effective um, uh, operation by these institutions that that may be effective in commanding other resources. But I, I, you know, I, I, I don't have a strong sense of whether it can get any worse by that kind of disengagement. Again, I think what's critical is to so start off with an agreement as to what is the core compact that undergirds these institutions. Why are they important? Uh, why do we need to subsidize them? And, um, and then from there, hopefully, you can still create a world in which we get our cake and eat it too. That is, you give them the resources but, and have the accountability, but nevertheless, the independence that's critical for effectiveness. Okay. Tom, Tom Carl August from Washington, D.C. I am also a Baltimore Oriole season ticket holder. <laughs> uh, tell, us, thank you. tell us a little bit about, in a private university, you spent a whole lot of time going out raising funds. What kind of pressure do you get from the major donors versus the political guys that are at Cal and Michigan and those other, uh, in the public schools? You must have some uh, pressures beating on you. And how much time do you spend actually going around raising bucks? So um, why don't I ask you to take a guess? Because I, I actually know the precise answer. What do you think as a percentage of my time I'm spending as a university president on fundraising? 25%? Yeah, it's 25%. Nicely done, sir. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> we didn't coordinate beforehand, but I was, I was really hoping you were gonna say 80%, and I was gonna shock you with the 25%, but it's about 25%. And I, I would say, look, um, I've been in academic leadership for about 20 plus years as a dean, as a provost, as a president. And you know, are there moments when you've got a donor who says, I need you to do this in this way, and you're saying, not going to work, not congruent with academic values, distorts mission, and you, you, know, you try and persuade them back and forth, and sometimes, you know, there have been, on a, you know, a few occasions, I just said, no, it looks like we just have to shake hands part ways. But I would say, you know, um, for me, what's so striking in, um, in the work that I do is, how incredibly supportive people are and trusting of the institution that um, you know you really feel it's in service of mission and not distorting mission. And look, um, you know, I come from an institution which, of course, is blessed with an extraordinary uh, benefactor, Mike Bloomberg. You know, we we did. You know, we've had these again. Mike is extraordinary, but we've had these conversations where I've. You know, we had our last major gift from him was $350 million. Once we had, you know, once he understood the idea and kicked the tires on the idea, you know, just wanted to make sure that we could execute it, um, that, was, that was the end of it. There's not regular, you know, interventions. I mean, and, and that's, a, he's exceptional in terms of the quantum and the character of his relationship to the institution. But there are a lot of people that are, you know, operate precisely the same way where they just fundamentally believe in, in what the institution is doing and want to be part of it. So I, I, I think this is, is ironic because one of the original rationales for state intervention, meaning state support for public universities, was the fear of distortion of, of mission by private benefaction. And I think, in fact, um, it's changed. 
Hi, I'm Dr. Kathy Klug, and I work locally here at the public high school. And I want to say that your conversation today could be um, five items on the Ideas Fest for the next 10 years. You spoke about tenure, kids in research, admission and access perception, and reform issues at the public universities. And I want to say that um, I think I want to address one question. Have you considered um, reforming the invitation to the dance at our highly, um, you mentioned UNC, Michigan, uh, University of Texas, Austin, uh, University of uh, Virginia. You mentioned them as public institutions. The invitation to the dance and access is not available to kids unless they have completed and done everything. They're the elite of their high schools. They get in and they're presenting themselves as an already completed student. Where does the um, underserved student without the kind of information to get into those places, without the kind of experiences to get into our flagship public universities, where do they get access? And wouldn't it be better if admission invited them the learners of this world, the potential learners to come to universities rather than the finished products of a really great K-12 system. And That's so, a great question. I mean, yeah. it's about social mobility, right? Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And in truth, it's a question that should not just be laid at the doorstep of the public. It's all of us. You know, that is that there's a, that, you know, again, if we see these institutions as the critical place where social mobility and the Jeffersonian ideal of equal opportunity happens in this country, we gotta, we've, gotta, we've gotta do better on this. Again, I'm gesturing to Dan Porterfield, who's been working with us and, uh, and a, number of, a number of other institutions, and thinking about ways, to your point, we're more effective in reaching out to students we know have the capability. So, you know, every student registers, you know, for ACTs and SATs, we know their scores. We're now getting more effective at reaching out to those students and saying, apply to us. We're getting simpler stories. You know, um, in the case of Baltimore, we have said we wanted, we felt we had a special duty, to your point, for students in Baltimore and the Baltimore City public school system. And so we just made a very simple statement. We said any student in the Baltimore City public school system that can get into Johns Hopkins we're gonna make it simple. Not only will you get a full tuition waiver, we'll pay all your room and board. So it's just a very simple, it's a simple message. And you know, it's things like that. It's both outreach, it's messaging, so you simplify the story that hopefully will increase, uh, again, the, um, uh, the penetration of our institutions by, uh, by students from low socioeconomic backgrounds. But I think what you're saying in terms of starting younger, finding ways for the students within, again, within the local area to get on the campuses, to participate in summer mentorship programs, we're doing all of those things. And this is an area where I think both public and private universities, there's a lot of really interesting experimentation underway in this country. And you know, just as I would say for me, I've been in the United States about, a, uh, about 11 years. For me, what's been really striking is over that period of time is seeing a world in which when this university's student body was being evaluated in terms of how are we doing in terms of our social role, a lot of it was focused on underrepresented minorities. That's tr still true today, but I think for the first time, your Pell percentages, the percentage of students that are Pell recipients, which is, again is proxy for low socioeconomic background, that's becoming an, another major way in which we evaluate the social performance of institutions. So I'm actually feeling pretty encouraged about the kind of dynamism and experimentation that's underway, and think again over the next several years we're gonna see some real inroads in this area. If I may just tack on to that, I think one of the most important things in this area is community college transfer programs. So there are just a lot of kids who aren't going to go from, thank you, aren't going to go yeah. from their local high school to the University of Colorado or to Johns Hopkins. And there are some institutions, the University of California I think is clearly the best, at, at, at creating on-ramps. 
So kids who go to community college and excel there, um, uh, often low-income kids, middle-income kids, are then able to get into schools. And, and so I, I think if we saw more of those, it would I, really help. I totally agree, because again, that's a great, great way for students from these backgrounds to find a way to our institutions. But you know, when you talk about, you know, for us, we're at about 14% Pell as a percentage of the total student body, which is, which is about average for our peer group. The University of California is at 35%, and they do that. Uh, University of California, Berkeley, and UCLA does that largely through two-year transfers from community colleges. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one more quick question right here. Hi, Andor. Quick question. You had mentioned the ROI grants between uh, younger faculty and older. Could you explain what that is between public universities and private? I, I don't know. I don't know whether the R01s, the percentages uh, for young investigators differ. I, I suspect not between publics and privates. But I, I just don't know the answer to that. But again, the critical issue is between young and senior investigators and just finding these young investigators caught in the buzzsaw. Thank you, Ron. Thank you all for these wonderful questions. Thanks. That was great, David.